Twin Studies and Homosexuality. The claim is often made that homosexuals were, as they would say, born with it, born with homosexuality. Um, the claim was made last week here that uh, this was falsified in 2014 by eight separate studies of identical twins conducted in Australia, the U.S., um, that showed people are not born with gay genetics. I will tell you up front that there's also studies in Sweden and uh, uh, Finland in particular. But uh, that's the claim. And the question is, is that statement true? Because, of course, it runs totally counter to the standard uh, way of looking at things. Well, before we begin on that, we should probably... Uh, mention a few things about homosexuality and about twin studies. First, what is homosexuality? Um, is it desire, fantasy, arousal? Is it uh, thinking homosexual thoughts? Is it uh, identification? Is it calling yourself a homosexual? Is it uh, sexual acts? As the uh, CDC would call it, men having sex with men, or MSM. No relation to the mainstream media. Um, but, uh, uh, and of course, the reverse women having sex with women. Um, those are not necessarily the same thing. And one can have an identification without actually acting on it. One can have desires without acting on it. And of course, one can even have sexual acts without having desires other than being paid for it enough. Um, so those things are not necessarily all identical. Now the assumption can be made that they all go together, but this is not necessarily the case. So when you're talking about homosexuality, you need to define what you're talking about. And beyond that, there's the matter of bisexuality people who have sex with both their own gender and with those of another gender. And um, uh, you know, if it's bisexual but mostly homosexual, is that homosexual or is that bisexual? And in fact, there's a kind of a standard uh, scale that goes back to Kinsey that uh, allows you to divide it into seven categories, one of which is uh, pure heterosexuality, one of which is homosexuality, and all grades in between. And furthermore, it turns out that people at various times in their life drift into and out of, and that's right, they drift out of as well. Uh, maybe sometime we'll look at that phenomenon as well. Um, so you're talking about a moving target. Well. What about twin studies? Well, twin studies are very ideal for what we're trying to talk about, which is, is it genetic? Because twins have almost identical genetics. Not quite. There are minor mutational differences, perhaps three or four in the whole genome. And then, of course, differences. Uh, in fact, our own bodies uh, have different mutations in different parts of them that have been passed on down. Um, every once in a while you'll see somebody with one blue eye and one brown eye. That's a mutational difference between two parts of his body or her body. So there are minor mutational differences that can happen even with us. But of course they're dwarfed by the similarities when you compare it with other humans. So for practical purposes, monozygotic twins are genetically identical. 
And as long as you don't insist on absolutely 100%, you know, maybe 99.8% or maybe 99% would be okay. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, share half of their genes, just like other siblings. Of course, they share a common uterus at the same time, and so any maternal influences are going to affect both twins more or less the same. And so this forms a control between genetics and early intrauterine influence and also, in a certain sense, uh, the rest of the, uh, of the upbringing. Now, of course, unrelated people are different. Here we have to be careful not to emphasize that too much because, of course, unrelated people may be different, but they're certainly more similar to each other than they are to, let's say, chimpanzees. Uh, so what we're doing is we're comparing uh, unrelated people to identical twins with fraternal twins being just about halfway in between. Now, genetic influences can be estimated. It won't be exact, but it'll be close enough. Um, the genetic influence is equal to all of what the identical twins are compared with everybody else. The dizygotic twins have half of that difference. And so if you measure the difference between the monozygotic twins and the dizygotic twins and double that, you should have the genetic influences. So you subtract the percentage of, let's say, homosexuality in this case, um, that, that monozygotic twins are. Uh, you subtract from that the dizygotic twins, and you double that, and that should give you the genetic uh, component for whatever the trait you're working with, say homosexuality. Now, there are also shared environmental influences, being in the same womb at the same time, the mother eats whatever, um, the kids get influenced more or less the same. And uh, uh, also the mother brings up the kids at the same time, presumably treating them more or less equally. Uh, and uh, that shared environmental influence can be estimated. Um, there are some minor corrections to this, but it's pretty close. As the shared environmental influence is equal to whatever the concordance of the dizygotic twins are, subtracting from that the monozygotic, uh, the difference between the monozygotic and the dizygotic twins. And if you do a little math, you can see that that turns out to be uh, two times the dizygotic minus the monozygotic. And you will see this in the literature. Now, the unshared environmental influences can be estimated, and it turns out very interesting, because the unshared is equal to 1, or 100% if you prefer, minus 2 times the monozygotic minus the dizygotic, that is minus G, minus S, which is two times dizygotic minus monozygotic. Now, if you do a little math to it, first thing we're going to do is uh, multiply the two times the dizygotic there. So we're bringing, uh, 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 we're bringing the commutative ability of uh, multiplication there. Uh, excuse me, the distributive uh, multiplication. And then we're going to change the signs where we have a minus and then a minus in the middle to be pluses. And then we're going to cancel two dizygotic minus two dizygotic is of course going to be zero. And one monozygotic will cancel with one of the other two monozygotics, and when you get done, you have one minus a monozygotic. What that means is that the unshared environmental influences are basically equal to what percentage of the twins are different from each other. A very simple uh, result, which is kind of striking.
Now, the assumption, of course, is made that the dizygotic twins are treated exactly like the monozygotic ones, which isn't quite fair. Monozygotic are probably, in most cases, a little more likely to be dressed alike and so forth. Um, and um, they sometimes share the same amniotic, uh, or the same uh, placenta, which never happens with the dizygotic twins. And so there are some minor subtle differences but it's pretty close. Um, where does free will fit into that? Well, officially it doesn't. Because these are scientists after all and assume we don't have free will. But if free will is there, it's very difficult to model it. But perhaps the best way to, to assume is that it falls somewhere in the unshared influences. That is to say, uh, one twin decides to do something where the other twin decides not to. Um, that would give you a difference. It would be in the unshared environmental influences in this kind of division. Now, how big is it? Nobody knows. Okay, so that's the background. Now, if everything is determined by genetics, identical twins should have almost... I absolutely identical desires, identities, and actions regarding sexuality. In other words, they should behave identically and feel identically. Whatever differences there are between identical twins should be at least potentially modifiable because it's either shared environment or it's free will. Or, pardon me, unshared environment. And presumably, if you were to share the environment, you would wind up with uh, a change. And presumably, if you decided differently, you would wind up with a change. So it looks like um, there should be at least the potential to modify that much of activity. Okay, Twin studies have been used to look for a genetic basis for, among other things, left-handedness. I've actually seen these papers. Um, obesity, political leanings, and surprise, surprise, homophobia. Um, well, what about that claim that we heard last week? Well, I talked to the presenter, and um, near as I can tell, it comes from a um, website that's listed above there um, in the new improved version, thanks to um, Jeff here. Um, eight major studies of identical twins in Australia the U.S. and Scandinavia during the last two decades all arrive at the same conclusion. Gays were not born that way. Quote, at best genetics is a minor factor, end quote, says Dr. Neil Whitehead, Ph.D. Whitehead worked for the New Zealand government as a scientific researcher for 24 years, then spent four years working for the United Nations in an international atomic energy agency, most recently, he serves as a consultant to Japanese universities about the effects of radiation exposure. His PhD is in biochemistry and statistics. Sounds impressive. Well, I guess we'll just have to bow to that. Well, actually, he is a member of the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. That is to say, he is part of a group that tries to make gays into ex-gays. Well, as you probably know, that's a very politically incorrect thing to do. And understandably, LGBT activists do not regard Dr. Whitehead as unbiased. So if we're going to reasonably settle a controversy, at least for ourselves, I don't know if we'll settle it for everybody, but uh, at least to try to make as fair a judgment as we can, we need to go back to the original data. Well, where can you get that? Well, I'm going to start with the early data. The one that really put this on the map is Bailey and Pillard in 1991, a genetic study of male sexual orientation, Archives of General Psychiatry 48. And uh, you will notice that uh, it's available on the web for free. Um, there's another article by Bailey, and this time in Bell, in 1993, about 
female and male homosexuality. Unfortunately, when I tried to Google it, I could not get it, and so I have not actually looked at that one. I am guessing that it's a rehash of what he did in Bailey and Pillard, Neal, and Aguirre, 1993, Heritable Factors Influence Sexual Orientation in Women, also in the Archives of General Psychiatry. And that one is available on the internet as well. Now, the abstract for the first paper, the most famous paper, homosexual male probands with monozygotic co-twins, dizygotic co-twins, or adoptive brothers were recruited using homophile publications. That means they put ads in gay newspapers um, and magazines. Sexual orientation of relatives was assessed either by asking relatives directly or when this was impossible, asking the probands. Of the relatives whose sexual orientation could be rated 52 percent, or 29 of 56, of monozygotic co-twins, 22 percent, 12 of 54, of dizygotic co-twins, and 11 percent, 6 of 57, of adoptive brothers were homosexual. Heritabilities were substantial under a wide range of assumptions about the population base of homosexuality and its ascertainment bias. However, the rate of homosexuality among non-twin biological siblings, as reported by the probands, 9.2% was significantly lower than would be predicted by a simple genetic hypothesis and other re published reports. Now, I want you to take a look at a couple of things on here. One of them is that this is not 100%. So, apparently there's some wiggle room. About half of homosexuality is influenced by non-shared environmental influences and possibly free will. So, um, that's not something that is made a lot of noise about, but um, the next thing I want to point out is 52% is over twice 22%. What that means is there are no shared environmental influences. Now that's almost impossible to believe. In fact, there are negative shared environmental influences. Now, one could say, well, yeah, but the statistics come, uh, could come out right. We're going to see some uh, data where it's even worse. Um, the next thing to notice is that 22% of dizygotic co-twins, which are basically brothers, share homosexuality, but down here, only 9.2% of other brothers share homosexuality. Something is weird. Those numbers should be roughly identical. Well, maybe it's just statistics. But something weird is going on. As they say themselves, the rate of homosexuality among non-twin biological siblings, as reported by Provence, well, maybe they didn't know, was significantly lower than would be predicted by simple genetic hypothesis and other published reports. Hmm. Okay. A Provence self-reported history of childhood gender nonconformity did not predict homosexuality in relatives in any of the three subsamples. In other words, most homosexual, homosexuals apparently did not play with dolls when they were kids. Uh, this is, of course, men. That's a little weird. It's not what you usually hear. And by the way, it doesn't match other studies. But we haven't got into that yet, so we'll just kind of let you know that and move on. Um, thus, childhood gender nonconformity does not appear to be an indicator of genetic loading for homosexuality. Co-twins from concordant monozygotic pairs were very similar for childhood gender uh, nonconformity. Interesting. Okay, well, to get back to the paper itself, I'm just going to read a few paragraphs that have, are of interest. One factor that has increased interest in biological explanations of sexual orientation is the continuing tension between those who view homosexuality as an illness. I'm that should be as an illness. Uh, the dictation took it wrong. Um, 
or sign of moral weakness and those who see it simply as an alternative phenotype without moral or pathological implications. It appears that one's ideological theory of homosexuality may contribute importantly to one's views on this larger issue. For example, in American psychiatry, it has been those holding psychodynamic serious... Uh, I must have missed something there too. Uh, holding psychodynamic uh, theories, that should be, about the origin of homosexuality who have been most closely associated with the position that the homosexual is ill. A 1970 survey showed that for, found that 43% of Americans believed that frequently, quote, young homosexuals became that way because of older homosexuals, end quote. Not surprisingly, and that should be capitalized, that's my mistake, um, that same survey found a high degree of intolerance towards homosexuals. A recent survey found that those who believe that homosexuals are born that way held significantly more positive attributes, attitudes towards homosexuals than subjects who believe that homosexuals choose to be that way and or learn to be that way. So, this question is kind of a political dynamite and you can see why there would be a lot of noise about it. Given the general interest and irrelevance of biological explanations of sexual orientation, it is somewhat surprising that very little work has been done in this realm from a behavior genetics perspective. People believed what they wanted to believe, and nobody went out and tested it. So he's trying to test it. Well, in an early twin study, this is interesting, in an early twin study of male homosexuality, Kalman, and he's reported it twice, reported a 100% concordance rate for 30 mo 37 monozygotic twins. Aha! Twin pairs compared with a 15% rate for 26 dizygotic pairs. You see what's wrong with this picture? The dizygotic should be 50%, right? Maybe 55, maybe 60. Kalman's study has been criticized for its methodological shortcomings, particularly the atypicality of the homosexual subjects who were largely sampled from correctional and psychiatric institutions. Oh. The absence of an explanation of the zygosity diagnostic procedure. How do you know they're dizygotic versus monozygotic? The dizygotic were obviously the ones that were... Uh, Divergent, something's wrong there. And it's anomalous findings. Nobody believes that. Results of several case studies in small twin series reviewed by Pillard et al. Pillard is one of the authors of one of our, our other uh, papers. Uh, suggest that the true MZ concordance rate is substantially less than 100% and probably near 50%. Notice that their statistics were 52. Largely because of this overestimation, Kalman's results have been questioned. That's a polite way of saying I don't believe it. Um, the paper goes on to say uh, that homosexuals know most of the time what their relative sexual orientation is um, uh, and give some evidence for that. And then has this interesting comment, ascertainment bias. The sampling method employed in this study falls short of the ideal genetic epidemiological study, which would involve systematic sampling from a well-specified population. In particular, although all recruiting advertisements stated that the provans were desired regardless of the sexual orientation of their relatives, there is no guarantee that volunteers heeded this request or perhaps non-volunteers decided to drop out because they didn't have a homosexual identical twin. Now, to move on to the female study, homosexual female probands with, I'm of course not reading the whole thing. Um, if you see a little dot here, that means that I'm continuing a paragraph that I broke up into two slides because it was too big. Homosexual female, female probands with monozygotic co-twins, dizygotic co-twins, or adoptive sisters were recruited using homophilic, pardon me, homophile 
publications. So again, they advertised in lesbian magazines. Sexual orientation of relatives was assessed either by asking relatives directly or when this was impossible by asking the probands. And they often asked both and tried to correlate so they knew how, how, how well the probands guessed. Of the relatives whose sexual orientation could be confidently rated, 34 or 48% of 71 monozygotic twins, eh, about 50% again. Six, 16% of 37 dizygotic co-twins, wait a minute, that should have been 25%, right? 24. We're short again. And two of 35 adopted, adoptive sisters were homosexual. Probands also reported 10 or 14% non-twin biologic sisters to be homosexual, although those sisters were not contacted to confirm their orientations. Let's go back here. Notice that 6% of adopted, 16% of dizygotic co-twins, now when we're coming over here, we're having 14%. This is more like what we would expect. Um, although those sisters were not contacted to confirm their orientations. Her heritabilities were significant using a wide range of assumptions about both the base rate of homosexuality in the population and ascertainment bias. I think we can say that the heritability is probably greater than zero, probably less than 100. But because of this bias, you don't know exactly where you are. The likelihood that a monozygotic co-twin would also be homosexual is unrelated to measured characteristics of the proband, such as self-reported history of childhood gender nonconformity. Again, that's an anomalous finding. Concordant mono, although it's not quite as anomalous in, in women as it is in men. Um, uh, girls that play with trucks and guns apparently are not quite as likely to turn out to be lesbian as guys that play with uh, dolls and so forth are going to turn out to be uh, homosexual. Um, concordant monozygotic twins reported similar levels of childhood non uh, gender nonconformity. Okay, and this again has some paragraphs that are kind of interesting. Other than isolated case reports, the only twin studies of female homosexuality of which we are aware consist of a series of four pairs of monozygotic twins reared apart. None of the four pairs were con was concordant. Whoa! Although the authors suggested that female homosexuality may, may be predominantly environmental, their sample was not sufficiently large to justify a strong conclusion. Well, yeah, but, um, but you never heard that study quoted before. And uh, then they get a comment about ascertainment bias again. The primary threat to the validity of the central finding that genetic factors may play a role in the origin of female sexual orientation is ascertainment bias. Because probands would not be obtained through systematic sampling, and particularly given the evidently low probability of ascertainment, it is possible that patterning of volunteering yielded misleading results. Yeah? One kind of ascertainment bias evident in our studies was overrepresentation of monozygotic probands, who consisted approximately two thirds of the sample. They were really interested in getting into the. Uh, uh, in comparison, uh, approximately half of the same sex twin births are monozygotic. In other words, they're overrepresented by uh, about twice what you'd expect. This overrepresentation is a common characteristic of volunteer twin samples. So we see this all the time. So it's not a big surprise. Another kind of ascertainment bias that occurred in the present study concerns the fact that probands were recruited via advertisements in homophile publications. It is unknown if female homosexuals who read such publications differ in important respects from those who do not. Future studies of sexual orientation that avoid this bias, for example, through the use of twin registries, are clearly desirable. Now, those are some pretty strong caveats when they're writing. 
And they go on to say, these findings should be considered in the context of prior research on this and related questions. Thus, for instance, the dis discordance of all four female MC pairs uh, reported by Eckert et al. I, I think that's supposed to be MZ. You know what? I, that's a dictation error. Yeah, monozygotic pairs. Uh, suggests a need for caution in drawing conclusions from our study, although our, their small sample size does not allow powerful tests of differences between the two studies. Similarly, King and McDonald's recent twin study of male and female homosexuality combi uh, combined found markedly lower concordance rates than either this study or our previous study of male sexual orientation. On the other hand, another recent report found even higher concordance rates. Given the serious methodological concerns, particularly of that of ascertainment bias, inconsistency of some past research, and the small number of related studies, we urge that our results be evaluated cautiously. Very well put. Now the male study in 1991, which came two years before the female study, made a huge splash. The caveats tended to be understated when the uh, mainstream media repeated it. The near proof that homosexuality was not entirely genetic tended to be overlooked. Um, conservatives, of course, had a reaction to that, and I'm going to go to two sources. One is uh, Jones and Yarhouse, although actually I'm not going to go to the book itself. I'm going to go to a synopsis by Jones um, that uh, uh, is available at the website that's listed. The uh, February, uh, this is part of the synopsis, and I'm quoting in the middle of a paragraph just to illustrate the point of uh, how this has been missed. The February 24, 1992 Newsweek magazine had a cover picture of a baby's face with the headline, Is This Child Gay? Coverage like this has convinced the public of the genetic cause of homosexuality. Well, it depends on whether you, you know, cause or influence. Certainly not a full cause. Um, and then another paragraph, but note three problematic things about this study, referring to Bailey and Pillard. That's the, the 1991 male study. First, the 52 proband wise concordance rate clearly indicates that this is at most a genetic influence and not a genetic cause. If homosexuality was genetically caused in the same way eye or hair color are caused, the concordance should be 100%, not 50%. Or 99.99 something percent, just like uh, our eyes match each other most of the time. Um, this kind of influence is a type of causation, but as laypersons use the term cause, they imagine complete determination of ori or orientation, and this is not what was found. The 52% findings I indicates that factors other than genetics must also be at work. Second, many people misunderstand what Bailey and Pollard actually found. We think that what 29 over 56 means is they found 56 twin pairs of which about half the pairs were both gay. Uh, left perception com column below, but what they actually found was what's displayed in the right hand column. And here's what he's talking about. This is what many people would look at, 29 matched twin pairs, which they're both gay, and 27 non-matched pairs. What really happened is you have 13 matched pairs and one triplet adding up to 29 people in there. And uh, then 27 non-matched twin pairs where only one twin was gay. So that kind of uh, makes it a little bit different, although uh, I would still say if you picked at random a twin that was gay, you'd have to say that the chances that his co-twin was gay, well, no, actually the chances that his co-twin is gay is... Um, is um, actually about one-third instead of one-half. In this display, the lighter blue figures represent gay brothers and the black ones heterosexual brothers. Of 41 pairs total, they found 14 matched groups, 13 twin pairs and one triplet, and 27 twin pairs that did not match. This misunderstanding is a result of the statistical definition they used. Bailey did not report regular percentages, but reported proband-wise concordances. Well, there are tedious definitional and statistical issues here. A simple summary is the following. Proband-wise concordances involve counting matches for every homosexual person, 
So whenever there's a twin pair that matches, you have two matches, one match for each brother. A simple example will illustrate. We have only two twin pairs, one with both twins gay, A and B, with A counting as a match for B and B counting as a match for A, and the other with only one gay twin, which counts as a single non-match for the one gay twin. We do not have a 50% proband-wise concordance, as many would expect, but rather 67%. Um, two matches divided by three possibilities to match. Okay. Now, so instead of the common understanding that Bailey studied 56 total identical twin pairs with 29 pairs matching for homosexuality and 27 not matching, what Bailey really found in those early studies was 41 pairs with 27 pairs that did not match for sexual orientation, 13 that matched as twin gay pairs, and one uh, triplet match where all were gay, which counts three yielding 29 matches total divided by 29 matches plus 27 failures to match. And that's how they did their statistics. But the third and deepest problem with the early Bailey and Pollard studies was their samples. If you're going to give a good estimate of genetic influence in a population, you must have a truly representative sample of that population. The samples for Bailey and Pollard studies were gathered by advertising in gay publications in the Ch Chicago area with the result that there was absolutely no guarantee that the sample was a good representation of the general homosexual population. Because their sample was not guaranteed to be representative, there was a chance that they got a biased sample that overrepresented genetic influence. For instance, it is credible to believe that homosexual persons who favored a more genetic explanation for their experience and whose family was more consistent with the genetic hypothesis were more likely to volunteer for the study than those whose family patterns did not favor such an explanation. So what you have is actually cherry-picked data, not by the researchers, they tried hard not to, but by the people who were responding. Thankfully, Bailey realized that this might be a problem and did a study that corrected this sample problem. He went to the one place where you're guaranteed to get a truly representative sample, the Australian Twin Registry, which registers every twin born in the entire country. He administered a questionnaire about sexual orientation and behavior to the entire twin population. When he did this study, his original finding was almost completely wiped out. Here are the findings of the new Bailey studies, right column, compared with the original findings. And there's the table. And you can see it was 29 over 56, counting the way they did. Now we're talking 3 of 27, which if you use the same mathematics, it comes out to 20%. And you're going, how does that work? Well, the three that match, so that's six. And now you have, instead of 27 pairs, you now have 30 people in there. So six out of 30 is 20%. That's where that number came from. Notice that for dizygotic twins, they had zero out of 16. That's probably a statistical artifact. This may be a statistical artifact too. It may have been five. It may have been one. It depends on what ha happens with random numbers. Now, they didn't do non-twin siblings or adopted siblings, so we don't have data on that. But that does give you an idea of what can happen when suddenly you get a better uh, statistical base to work with. Proband-wise concordance for identical twins in this representative sample dropped from 52% to only 20%. Of 27 identical twin pairs, only three matched for homosexual orientation. Bailey, Dunn, and Martin are precise about the implications of their new research, con commenting that this study did not provide statistically significant support for the importance of genetic factors for homosexual orientation. Further, they admitted that this suggests that concordances from prior studies, that is, his own two studies, well, plus some others, were inflated due to concordance-dependent ascertainment bias, or, in other words, sample bias. And whereas his original findings got enormous media attention, his new findings have been completely ignored by the media, and more importantly, most introduction to psychology textbooks. And um, continuing on with this um, 
um, article. Uh, Bierman and Bruckner, 2002, analyzed an enormous database generated by detailed interviews and surveys of many tens of thousands of American adolescents. They looked for patterns of family experience that resulted in increased likelihood of the adolescent reporting homosexual attraction. Their findings? Opposite sex twin, 16.8% had homosexual... That's uh, quite a bit lower than 50%, no? That's close to that 20% that we've been hearing about before. Um, wait a minute. But that's the opposite sex. That's one girl and one boy. That's not even the ones we're looking for that should be identical. Where's the identical? Well, there it is. Same sex, 9.9%. And now the same-sex dizygotic is 9.8%. If you believe those numbers, which I don't completely, but it, you know, I guess they're probably somewhere in the ballpark, there is no genetic influence whatsoever. Well, one-tenth of one percent, that's statistical noise. Now, I'm not sure I believe it entirely, but the numbers must not be too big or we wouldn't get those kind of numbers. I want you to remember those numbers because we're going to come back to them. The authors argue that the base rate of same-sex same attraction in this study is around 7.5%. They found one constellation of family relationships, however, that resulted in the rates of same-sex attraction approximately double the base rate, and that was when a male sibling was part of a fraternal dizygotic uh, twin pair, whereas co-twin was a sister. In their words, we showed that adolescent male opposite sex, or here after OS, twins are twice as likely as expected to report same-sex attraction and that the pattern of concordance, similarity across pairs, of same-sex preference for sibling pairs does not suggest genetic influence independent of the social context. In fact, um, what they're saying is there's probably parenting. Uh, difficulty with parenting when you have a boy and a girl twin as your first kids. Stating their interpretation of these findings simplistically, they hypothesize that same-sex attraction is a result of incomplete gender socialization and that the task of parental gender socialization of children is significantly complicated when parents are confronted with accomplishing gender socialization when a boy-girl twin pair, opposite-sex twins, are born to them. They try to treat them the same, and of course, it's hard to do that. Well, you shouldn't, uh, whatever. Um, Parents trying to raise their boy to fully embrace masculine identity face special challenges when the boy has a twin sister. Now, of interest, you could also hypothesize that the boy's getting a little girl hormone in utero, right? So maybe it's just that the boy's a little feminized from the uterus. Stating their interpretations of these findings simplistically, they hypothesize that same-sex attraction is a result of incomplete gender socialization. They're not buying this theory, and here's why. And that the task of parental gender socialization of Behrman and Bruckner argued that an additional finding of their study further supports his interpretations. If the problem is incomplete gender socialization, then any family pattern that reinforces gender socialization should diminish the effect. And this is what they found. When the male OS co-twin has an older brother with whom the parents would have already honed their gender socialization skills, the elevation of same-sex attraction was wiped out. Without an older brother present, the same-sex attraction rate more than doubled. In other words, if you have an older brother, but, okay, so uh, you might hypothesize now that, well, then the more, kids, more male kids you have, the better off you're going to be. Well, it turns out that that's not true in general, just for opposite sex twins. In fact, in general, it's slightly reversed. The younger kids tend to be more likely to become homosexual. Among, I'm not going to prove that, but uh, I'll just tell you that that's what I've read from all the stuff I've been looking at. The Among male Opposite sex twins, the proportion reporting a same-sex romantic attraction is twice as high among those without older brothers, 18.7%, than among those with older brothers, 8.8%. In other words, you saw it was high to begin with, but if you separate them into older brothers, the older brothers drop down to everybody else, 
and, the, and without older brothers, it goes even higher. They argue that their results support the hypothesis that less gendered socialization in early childhood and pre-adolescence shapes subsequent same-sex romantic preferences. It's significantly complicated when parents are confronted... Wait a minute. Yeah. Complicated when parents are confronted with uh, accomplishing gender socialization when a boy-girl pair, opposite sex twins, are born to them. Parents trying to raise their boy to fully embrace masculine identity face special challenges when that boy has a twin sister. Putting these arguments together, we can argue that science has not eliminated responsibility for sexual behavior. The church's moral concern is not fundamentally... Uh, by the way, this is skipping down a few paragraphs, too. Um, uh, church's moral concern is not fundamentally with homosexual orientation, no matter how it develops. We do not fully understand what a sexual orientation is, but from a moral perspective, from a Christian perspective, may best be understood as one of the many ways in which we humans, sinful and fallen as we are, are inclined to lean towards choices and patterns that do not bring honor to God. There's just one more of the traps out there. The church's moral concern is what one does with one's experience of same-sex attraction. Only in the case of extreme biological determination at the level of individual acts would moral culpability seem to be, be seen as obliterated. Homosexual persons are not subhuman robots whose acts are pre predetermined. They are moral agents who inherit tendencies from biology and environment and who share, share in shaping their character by the responses they make it to their life situations. Like all persons, they must ask, this is what I want to do, but is it what I should do? The existence of inclinations or predispositions does not erase the need for moral evaluation of those inclinations. Now, that's the, the section on twins, uh, or a good share of it. And then there's a Whitehead, who's been mentioned before, and he has a book out called My Genes Made Me Do It. And that's actually available online, the whole book. Uh, the chapter that we're looking at, Twin Studies, The Strongest Evidence, is available um, at the website uh, listed. Over the last, the, this is the beginning words of the chapter. Over the last decade, studies of twins have provided some of the strongest numerical evidence that our genes do not make us do it, which makes this chapter probably the most important in the book. Results from twin studies are quantitative, so they greatly focus and sharpen the results of many other studies we've mentioned so far. In a nutshell, uh, missed a letter there. If you take pairs of identical twins which ha in which one twin is homosexual, the identical co-twin, co a monozygotic twin, is usually not homosexual. That means that given identical twins are always genetically identical, homosexuali homosexuality cannot be genetically dictated. No one is born gay. Well, maybe a few people... I mean, I'd have to say that he, that he can't say that quite that blanket. But what we can say is the vast majority of them are not born gay, and it's entirely possible that nobody is born gay. The predominant things that create homosexuality in one identical twin and not in the other have to be post-birth factors. Hold on to this simple thought as you navigate the complex world of twin studies in the pages of this chapter. And in Jones and Yarhouse, which is the reference that we were just, or the reference that I just was reading kind of a summary of, for the important Australian Bailey et al. SSA twin study paper, finds, uh, find that for self-declared lesbians and gays, the pairwise concordance is 14% and 11% respectively. This means that for every nine sets of male identical twins, one of which is homosexual, the other is homosexual only one time in nine or 11% of the time, which is not very much. That is, identical twins usually differ. Slightly different way of stating that if, if you're homosexual, what's the probability that your co-twin is homosexual? Uh, different question with a slightly different answer. What 11 concordance means, well, what does 11 uh, concordance mean? It does not mean that the 11% of identical twins have an SSA. Numerous studies of Western populations, chapter 2, uh, which, of course, if you want to know, you have to read that chapter, have shown that homosexuality, including bisexuality, is present in something between 2 to 3% of people. And this, of course, includes twins. That is, figure 3 shows 100 hypothetical twin pairs taken from a twin registry, of those 200 individuals, only four, roughly two to three percent of them, shown by the gray squares. If you want to look at the book, it's 
you can see it, have SSA. There are not enough pairs to show the rarer pairs, both of whom have SSA and are therefore concordant. It would have to be a little over twice as big as what he has. But I'm going to move down to a summary of studies. And if you will look, there's one, two, three different measures, four different measures, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you combine that with the, um, it's a Bruckner, Behrman and Bruckner study, that'll make eight studies. And I think that's where those eight twin studies come from. And if you look at this, there's percentages that run, depending on where you are, somewhere around a quarter, maybe a little more. It'd be interesting to put those numbers all together and turn them through the mechanical crank and find out uh, what the average should be. But, you know, 25, 30%. Looks pretty close. And uh, the figures uh, six, uh, you know, notice that they have uh, references for Bur uh, Burrich and uh, Hershberger and so forth, all of those. Um, and uh, and you'll notice that, for example, Hirsch. Uh, Hirschberger breaks down into t four different groups. Attractions when older than 25 years old, not counting the adolescent stuff. Same-sex partners when older than 25 years old, again, not counting the adolescent stuff, which apparently means that you have people who have adolescent sexual experiences, homosexual experiences, that go on to become heterosexual. Sexual orientation, what they think they are, same, but modeled to include, uh, include modeling including included siblings. So you have a whole bunch of different uh, variations of you know what homosexuality means, and they're kind of averaging all of those. And here's some other definitions: same-sex feelings now, same-sex partners in the last 12 months, fantasy, sexual orientation, attracted once or more over the lifetime, which not surprising. Um, is the highest one. Fantasy to date. Um, Same-sex partners over life to date. So you can measure it in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, let me just... And so you can see, you know, Kirk measured in different ways. Unfortunately, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure why they have just the mean there instead of the whole thing. Um, but you can see that 6 is the highest. And 6 is fantasy now. Interesting. Apparently fantasy was something that uh, happens very easily, but most people don't identify themselves or they don't act on it. Um, and then Langstrom, any time, lifetime SS partners, SS partners over life to date. So uh, you can see that there's a whole bunch of different ways of defining homosexuality and how they measure it determines. Now that's the women. And you'll notice that the women are running maybe a little higher. Probably more like 30 percent or so, 35, which is interesting. You, the men are the ones that claim it. The women are the ones where the evidence is stronger. Um, Bailey M. et al., 2000, in genetic and environmental instances. Let's go over that paper, you know. Um, uh, Behrman and Brooker, in fact, we're going to go over all of these. Those are the, those are the papers that they're quoting. And there's Kirk, Bailey, and Doug. Notice Bailey keeps popping up in all of these. He's apparently a big researcher in that area. Uh, here's Bailey again. Known as Burrich et al., but it's ba Burrich, Bailey, and Martin. Um, Hershberger. 
Uh, some of these have only the abstract available. And that means that they're hard to evaluate. Uh, Santilla, uh, this Santilla and Alenko, we're going to run into those names a couple of times more. Those, that's the Finnish study. And Langstrom et al. is the um, Swedish study. And here's another paper by Alenko and Santia and company, including von der Palen, if you may have noticed that name. So now I went through and asked the question, are they really right? Well, to summarize, in Bailey et al., they are precisely right. You can find the numbers. And I'm going to show you the numbers on a couple of these. And Behrman and Brucker, they're right. On Kirk et al., it's hard to tell. I'm not willing to say whether they're right or not. I can say that the, that the raw data isn't reported very well. That is, they don't say how many homosexual, at least not in a way that popped out to my eye. And I looked fairly hard. Uh, you may be able to do some t statistical analysis given that they did report the number of pairs they had and some of the percentages you could deduce how many people were uh, uh, monozygotic uh, concordant and monozygotic uh, discordant. Uh, Burrich et al. only has the uh, abstract and you can't tell from that. Hirschberg et al. also only has the abstract and I couldn't tell from that. Santia et al has the article, and yes, they're, they're correct in their quote. Uh, Langstrom et al. has the article online, and yes, you can tell from that. And then finally, Alenko et al. is sort of like Kirk et al. It's very hard to tell what's going on. The places I can prove whether they're right or not, they're right. There's some places that I might suspect that they maybe overinterpreted the data, but then again, maybe not. I'd have to study that a little harder. These ones, I'd have to get hold of the papers. Now, Behrman and Bruckner, 2002. You remember that the, they had that table out there? And here is the table. Same-sex monozygotic, 9.9%. Same-sex Dizygotic, 9.8%. Opposite sex twin, 16.8%. So yeah, they're exactly right. When they report those data, they're correct. Bailey et al. has a table where you can see here is 3 plus plus and 24 plus minus, which means that's 3 out of 27 which is exactly what they report. Now that's the strict definition, which is a Kinsey score of less than two. If you do a looser definition, then the numbers change slightly. There's more concordant pairs. But the uh, Kinsey one is, yeah, sometimes I have a few sexual fantasies, but you know, most of the time I'm heterosexual. Uh, in other words, that's just barely into the, that there's any homosexual uh, noticeable uh, at all. Uh, female, again, 3 out of 19. Yeah. So those numbers are correct. Um, reading some more in uh, Bailey et al., 2000, 28% explicitly refused to participate in their study and 54% completed questionnaires. The remainder initially agreed to participate but did not respond when contacted following one letter or one phone call. Our response rate was not substantially lower than that of other recent large scale male sex surveys which typically see response between 55 and 65%. So they're missing half their data. A little over, or a little under. Um, but that's the way it always is. Well, what about that missing half? Are those people who didn't want to report because they were afraid they were going to be homosexual? Or are those more likely to be people who didn't want to report because they're conservative and they hate this kind of stuff? Well, their opinion was 
There's some indication of a modest participation bias. People who returned consent forms and those who initially agreed to participate but could not subsequently be contacted generally had more liberal sexual attitudes, more novelty-seeking and less harm-avoidant personalities, an earlier age of sex first sexual intercourse, and a greatly, greater likelihood of childhood sexual abuse than people who explicitly... Oh, childhood sexual abuse is associated with uh, those other things, which is interesting. And as you may know, childhood sexual abuse is claimed to be 25% of the population and that I don't have any reason to challenge that claim. So, uh, then people who explicitly refused to participate in the sex survey. However, the effect sizes were small, suggesting that behavioral data in the mailed sex survey probably did not seriously misrepresent sexual activity and attitudes. So if there is any bias, it appears that the bias is towards people who are prudes who don't want to get involved, to put it that way. In other words, the actual data looks worse for making a homosexuality a, a, a major problem than, uh, than what the data we have is. Now, the next question is, well, did they cherry pick those studies? So I tried to do uh, two ways of checking on whether they were cherry picking the studies. Okay, number one, I did a citation search. All the studies would cite Bailey at all 2000. So it's the big study, it'd be the easiest way to find out if there's something at least enough more recent to where you could pick out that there's something going on. And the second one was to find um, a website that um, uh, Jeff introduced to me, uh, councilforresponsiblegenetics.org, and go through and see if they had any studies that I missed under twin studies. And um, I couldn't find anything else other than what had been reported. Um, the website had some interesting comments. Bailey et al. 2000, that's of course the big study. This Australian twin study utilizes a sample of size of 1091. The sample included 312 male identical twins, yada, yada, yada. Childhood gender and nonconformity appeared to be heritable in both men and women, as opposed to the other study that we had, remember? There was a lower concordance found compared to prior studies for self-identified sexual orientation. Uh, we saw that. The males in the sample scored higher than the females on Kinsey scale. The authors suggested that sexual orientation should be analyzed separately for males versus females. I wonder why they didn't put in the exact numbers there. Would have been interesting. And then this comment on Kirk et al. 2000. Uh, this study utilized a, a sample of 4,901 Australian twins. Sexual orientation was assessed utilizing a self-report method. The data suggested a heritability of between 0.50 and 0.60 in females, and about 0.30 in males for homosexual orientation. I've omitted these studies earlier than 2000 because most of them didn't try to control for how you get the uh, specimens, or how do you get the, the, the subjects. And um, then there was another study they mentioned in Kirk, M, KM, and Bailey, a, JM, Etiology of Male Sexual Orientation in an Australian... That's this the same one. Be done. This Australian study focused on the sexual orientation of male twins out there reduced volunteer bias by enrolling it via twin registry and using anonymous questionnaires. Several variables were found to be significantly heritable, including sexual feelings, sexual fantasies, attraction to men, and number of sexual partners. Which is basically Kirk and uh, Bailey and two other guys uh, rehashed. You can see how these guys get their publications padded. Um, and they had one more that I had missed. And that was Ken Lurke uh, and... Uh, I forgot to reduce that all to what it was supposed to be. Sexual orientation in a U.S. national sample of twins and non-twin sibling pairs, American Journal of Psychiatry. And um, in 1930, non-twin siblings and 794 twin pairs were studied. 
3.1% of males self-reported as homosexual, while 2.5% of females reported as homosexual. You may have thought it was 10% of the population or 20%. It's not. It's quite low. 3% um, just fits with everybody else. 3, 4, 2, somewhere in there. Uh, concordance for homosexuality in, in monozygotic twins was 31.6%. That's overall. 44.4% for female. It's more uh, inheritable in females than in males. And 20% in males. Which is kind of like what everybody else is saying. Now, unfortunately, I didn't actually look at this one, so I don't know. How, well, 794 twin pairs, but that doesn't tell us how many homosexual twin pairs we had. This indicates that familial influences may differ between the sexes. Well, not surprising there. Evidence did not indicate that similar environmental experience in modern zygotic versus dizygotic twins contributed to the greater concordance for sexual orientations. In other words, it's all in this study anyway, which has been seen before and after. Uh, it's all either ge pure genetics by the math table or it's different environments. Now, there's one last study that I thought I would introduce to you while we're doing this, and this is Elenco and Santia. So this is our Finnish people again. Evidence for heritability of adult men's sexual interest in youth under age 16 from a population best extended twin design. And that one is also available on the web. ResearchGate is wonderful. And... Uh, I'm going to skip the first part of the abstract because we're running out of time. Results. The in incidence of sexual interest in children under age was 3%. Pretty close to homosexuality, no? Now, that's not how many people acted on it, by the way. They acted on it is like about, oh, 10% of the people who, act who think about it. Twin correlations were higher for monozygotic than dizygotic twins. Behavioral genetic models uh, fitting indicated that a model including genetic effects as well as non-shared environmental influences, including the measurement error, but not common environmental influences fit the data best. Same as we've seen before. Uh, the amount of variance attributable to non-additive genetic influences or heritability was estimated at 14.6%. So... It's almost uh, maybe half as genetic as homosexuality. Conclusions. The present study provides the first indication that genetic influences may play a role in shaping sexual interest toward children and adolescents among adult men. Compared with variants attributable to non-shared environmental effects plus measurement error, the contribution of any genetic factors seems comparatively weak. Not absent, but not overbearing. Future research should address the possible interplay of genetic with environmental risk factors, such as own sexual victimization in childhood. If somebody did you, you're likely to want to do somebody else. That's what it sounds like. Anyway, my take on all that is it's clear for twins, most of the causes, not all, of homo for homosexuality, however defined, are neither genetics nor shared environmental influences, including in utero shared environmental influences. In other words, you're not born with it. One may be born with a tendency, but it is relatively compared to the environment and your decisions, mostly in the environment, I think, relatively weak. The uniform experience of most gays, at least the ones that I have talked to and read about, is that they have always been that way. That's what they feel like. Which means either that they're not remembering right, I hope that's not true most of the time, but it may be, or more likely, what I think, is that early childhood experiences may have much to do with being gay, and some of them perhaps even before they can really remember well. This presentation did not deal with whether homosexual tendencies, identity, or activity is mutable in either direction. We mentioned a little bit, but we didn't really go into the data behind it. 
The subject is emotionally and politically charged, and object objectivity of various discussants should not be assumed. Myself included. Although I'm trying to be as objective as I can. Nothing said here should be used to prove that homosexuality, however defined, is a conscious choice most of the time. In fact, Dr. Whitehead, who is into reparative therapy, will tell you that that's not the case most of the time. So don't use this as, oh, they just chose it. But it does imply that the now popular view that homosexuality is mainly genetic in, in origin is incorrect. The fact that there is a genetic tendency does not prove that we should agree to say that homosexuality is normal for two reasons. Number one, they don't think it's normal. But I thought they did. No, they don't. They'll tell you, I would never have chosen this lifestyle. That's their linchpin for saying, see, I can't help it. I wouldn't have wanted to be this way. They are admitting that it isn't a good thing. Number two, is pedophilia and hebephilia. Hebephilia meaning you like young boys, I mean you like kind of just adolescent men. It's not quite the same thing as pedophilia, but it's kind of related. It's also partly genetic. We know that from that one twin study. Well, you'd like to see more than one twin study, but, um, but certainly we have good evidence for it. I think we still need to treat homosexuals decently. If they have urges but do not act on them, who are we to judge? In fact, we should encourage them in that case. Promiscuous heterosexuality is every bit as damaging as homosexuality, so we need to be careful about making homosexuality the only sin. It's not. Assuming that homosexuality is not optimal, which I happen to believe, we do not treat others whose lifestyles are not optimal badly. I do my best with smokers who come into my clinic. And I don't even always comment. I mean, you talk to them, they know the smoking's not good for you. You know, there, there comes a point where they're not really interested. And I don't feel a burden to try to push them to change. Not unless they want to. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? It only takes one. But the light bulb has to want to change. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Sorry, that turned out to be more material than I had hoped. Any comments, <coughs> questions, clarifications? It'll come on in a minute. They didn't try to differentiate uh, between the twins that were always in the same family versus those who were split and went to different families and grew up. Because I've heard studies about well, that. Well, the, the, the twins that were split, there was one study that studied only twins that were split, but they only had four of them. Oh. So... It's, it's unusual for twins to split. Usually they stay in the same family. So you're asking to study difficult, uh, you know, we don't have enough numbers for that. And that's one of the limitations we have in science. Uh, we have the same problem with, you know, um, uh, research in, let's say, advanced cardiac life support. Well, you've got to have find people who are arrested. And, you know, they arrest when they want to, not when you want to for your research purposes. And, um, and, and so you can't tell whether it's better to give magnesium or lidocaine as your third-line drug. 
because you don't have enough third line people to try it on. And so a lot of this turns out to be seat of the pants. These studies are a royal pain to do. You know, it involves somebody having a list of 700 people, and if they don't get, you know, mail back within a certain amount of time, they have to call them. And you can't just keep bugging everybody. There'll be a protocol because otherwise, you know, you bug some people more than others, and, and those are the people that, you know, now you're biasing your sample. So they usually allow for, you know, a, a certain set number of phone calls to try, and then that's it. In one case, it's one phone call. I think in another case there were two or three phone calls that they were allowed. But that's it. Uh, or maybe you'll remail them the application and hope this time it doesn't get thrown in the trash. Um, uh, you know, and then after you get done, you start asking, well, are these really monozygotic twins or not? And the ideal thing to do would be to, you know, get a blood sample from each one and, uh, and try to match them. But you can imagine how that gets expensive, and so they try various means. It, this is not, uh, this kind of studying is a huge amount of grunt work. That's what graduate students are for. No. Uh, <laughs> the modern day slaves. Um, pardon? Legal. Legal, yes, yeah, legal. In fact, you don't have to pay them anything. They pay you. They pay you. I mean, that, that's really good. <laughs> anyway, so it's, uh, you know, we're not going to have all of the answers for this. And that's why, you know, if I get a range, okay, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent, I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I can live with that as a, as a number. Um, and it really doesn't make too much difference if it's 25% or if it's 40%. You know? The main point is it's not 100%. We know that for dead share. And in fact, it's not probably even 50%. So the majority of influences are non-genetic. And if you read their numbers and you put them through their little sausage machines, most of it is not even shared experience. Most of it is, in fact, unshared experience, which means that that's something that could be modified because one twin got it and the other twin didn't. So there's nothing inevitable about this. Well, maybe for some people it is, but at least for a substantial majority of people, it's not inevitable. Yes? I'm coming in very late, so, um, <clears throat> but it's... <laughs> uh, I mean, it's like in lifestyle medicine where we say, you know, lifestyle loads the gun, but, uh, I'm sorry, uh, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the pulls trigger. The trigger. Uh, in other words, just because if there is any um, genetic predisposition for, for basically temptation, um, it doesn't mean that you are compelled to, to follow through on that. Yeah, well, I think some people do have a harder time. And there are people who, who drink a glass of wine at, uh, at dinner once a day for 60 years and never have a problem. And there are people who walk up and taste punch and realize what's in it. And also, at the same time, because I've read some of them that uh, said this, know that they're going to come back for more. It is... From the first time? From the first time. Right. person who is a teetotaler and got introduced without realizing it, and the effect just took over. So there, there's a wide range in human response to this kind of thing. Now, that person eventually kicked the habit, but it was terrible doing it. You know, uh, our, our fallen human nature, ex, you know, explains why we sin, but it doesn't, it doesn't justify it. 
yeah. if that makes sense. Um, and this is, this is where I think, you know, we have maybe some advantage in our, in our understanding from Scripture, uh, and that is that, yeah, we all have fallen human nature, but, but the power of God can give us victory. Uh, and so I, I uh, certainly, I don't know what, what I'm saying, but I, I certainly uh, appreciate the difficult position that people will be placed in if they have inherited tendencies to sin. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really think they, they deserve our support to be able to have victory over that, you know, inherited tendency. Um, but it, it doesn't, you know, this idea that, well, if, if I'm that way, if I have that tendency, then, you know, then God made me that way and therefore it must be somehow, you know, appropriate to follow through on that behavior. That'd be like saying, you know, somebody maybe had a, uh, you know, stereotypes here, but the Irish temper, like there's some, some uh -huh. genetic predisposition to that. And well, because I have an Irish temper, therefore it's okay for me to get upset, maybe kill somebody. Hey, you know, God made me that way. No, sin, you know, it's fallen human nature is what yeah. caused that defect. Yeah. Well, I mean, the same thing is that the alcohol uh, weakness that, we, that I just talked about. Or for that matter, pedophilia which is now shown, by, at least by one study, to be partly genetic. So a little weaker than homosexuality, but maybe for one particular person, it might be a really strong tendency. Um, I don't think we can say that because I have these tendencies that therefore they must be right. And but, I, I, I think that's the point you're making. Yeah, but but in the in the public debate about it, it's it's almost as though there's an agreement that if there is a genetic predisposition, then on the uh, sort of the uh, um, gay rights perspective, then then therefore it justifies it because we are that's who we are, that's how we're made, <clears throat> and so they they will be looking for evidence you know, scientific evidence support well, that One of the things they'll look for is homosexual behavior in other animals. Right, right. And see, because they do it, well, we can do it too. But on the, on the flip side, there's a lot of Christians who will try to make the argument that, no, we can't allow any, you know, we, we won't countenance any evidence for biologic <clears throat> predisposition, uh, whether inherited or, or um, in utero development or even you know, well, I suppose you need to development, environmental development. Um, and it's like, you know, I'd say to those Christians, say, wait a minute, I mean, you, you do admit that there is fallen human nature, right? I mean, that's... Uh, is, what's, what is original sin? Yeah, I, Other it than confuses me. An in, innate tendency to go wrong. I, is the power of God insufficient to give us victory over our fallen human nature? I, I, I don't read anything in the Bible that... Uh, well, there's Romans 7, but I think that that is, Romans 8 gives the answer to Romans 7. Well, uh, before, uh, before we use that too much, the one thing you need to be careful of is there are people watching, and they take advantage of every time something like this happens. Uh, a, a, a gay rescue uh, group. As finds one of its leaders in a gay bar. You had. Uh, because what you're saying is that what you're preaching to others isn't good enough for you. You know, it's kind of the, in a slightly different field, it's the uh, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, uh, Jim Baker, Tammy Faye Baker all over again. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Yeah. And I think that those of us, those of us who make any kind of claim that Christianity is helpful, have automatically, whether we like it or not, taken a certain burden on ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there but for the grace of God go I will work. <coughs> <laughs> right. But uh, there go I will not. <laughs> <laughs> or um, do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, 
normally human beings have free will and the power of choice. Uh, there are exceptions, and you know, mentally disabled and so on. We, we all know this. But uh, to a certain extent, I think we all have to fight and try and resist temptations uh, of all kinds that we face as we try and do what is right. And uh, I think all groups should be involved in that fight. It's, uh, you want to do what's right, you don't want to do what is good and so on, so uh, keep pushing in that direction. But at the same time, every time I meet somebody whom I know, who I have reason to believe is homosexual, I don't pass him out of track to, to send him to one of the reparative societies, you know? I try to treat them decently and, I mean, I don't see that we, we gain much by making a lot of noise about it. Oh, absolutely, but... Uh what I'm concerned about is the other side makes a lot of noise that this is, you can't help it. Well, thing. Th this is one of the reasons why I'm pointing yeah, out exactly. the data. I'm sorry, the other side is wrong. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, uh, or at least it's substantially wrong. That's just what I'm trying to say. You know, Let's keep trying doing what's good for everybody Yeah. and so on. But uh, we must not make excuses for our mistakes. Yeah. Well, I think next week, I almost split this in two. I probably should have. <laughs> next week, I'll try to get uh, those uh, pseudo fossils in. So, come on back.